Mishkin is a really interesting character because he is so different from everybody, well, at least a lot of people I meet in real life, I don't know about you know, other people, but he's a very innocent person. He doesn't have a lot of uh, pride about him. He's not boasting about his accomplishments. He's not saying, you know, trying to say, oh, I'm so much better than the rest of you. He's instead saying, no, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a humble guy. Uh, and he kind of, every time he has a conversation with a person, uh, a lot of times in the book, the, the person he's having a conversation with is kind of surprised and a little alarmed. Mishkin isn't necessarily trying to get something out of the conversation. He's not trying to win over somebody. Uh, he's not trying to manipulate. He just wants to live in a way that uh, suits his ideas and his ideals. So he's an innocent person. Um, and I think the way that the book works is the innocence of Prince Mishkin kind of um, acts as a way to reveal the ways that other characters in the book are informed by ego. And they're very much always about how, what they can get out of a situation, whether it be money, whether it be power, whether it be love. There's this idea that all these characters are pursuing some kind of um, self selfish benefit. Um, and just to talk about ego, ego is this kind of, you know, it's this idea of, you know, every, every person in life, they, they want to do things that provide them with pleasure. You know, that, that's a common idea. And some people say, no, uh, you know, the, the most important thing is to act without concern for oneself and to not pursue this pleasure uh, only, that you should be able to live for others. Um, now, Dostoevsky might have different ideas about this. And some, some people would say that when you try to help others or you try to um, you know, live for other people, uh, maybe that's actually just a way of make, giving yourself pleasure in some ways and making yourself feel good. Um, so I think it's important just to set this up that ego is the important thing to focus on when you look at all these characters in the way that ego informs their opinions, um, and informs their actions, I should say. Um, but it's also to note that it's not just Dostoevsky saying ego is bad, get rid of ego, stop trying to pursue your own pleasure. Uh, it's saying more that we should, um, that it's important to acknowledge and have an awareness of the way that your own ego and your own selfish um, feelings or self-centered self pleasure um, operates in everybody's life. Um, now, let's kind of start talking about the, the opening of this book. Um, we, we're introduced to um, uh, Prince Mishkin, who's on a, Prince Mishkin enters this home. He talks to the person letting people into, he talks to um, the val what they call the valet, the person who opens the door at the uh, state and kind of uh, sees whether, uh, what the person is asking for, and then kind of lets them into the, to the main room to talk to the colonel. Uh, uh, and so when he gets there, uh, the servant, the, the valet is kind of a little confused about why Mishkin is there. Um, he says he has some business, but the valet is really not sure what this business could be because Prince Mishkin, he doesn't look like a man who'd have business with a colonel. He looks like a, a kind of a not too wealthy man. He doesn't look like an important person. So the valet is trying to be polite and not ask mean questions but he's very confused. And I think in this confusion, you can kind of see something important in the book, which is that, you know, people are often confused or not really sure what Mishkin is doing with his life. And there's this kind of, you know, strange way that people, that when Mishkin acts in this way in a very naive way without any really plan of what he's doing, um, people are very, uh, you, you kind of get it, an idea of what the person Michigan is talking to you, talking to is like by the way they react because they, uh, they have their own idea of how people should live. And that comes, and when Michigan talks to them, it kind of comes through that their idea of life or how people are is completely different from how Michigan is. So the valet is asking questions, you know, 
and he he doesn't want to say what is your business uh but you know the valet says specifically uh you know do you are you asking for money from the colonel uh and uh michigan says oh no that's not really why i'm here and then the valet is kind of relieved but then the business he eventually learns is that uh you know michigan reveals that uh, the colonel's wife is a distant relation uh, and I just want to kind of call your attention to this important point uh, in the book so I'm going to again uh, share my screen here and let me pull it up in the book because it's important to note that there's also when Michigan is talking to the valet there's a there's a class difference so even though Michigan is not high in society uh, the servant is still a servant at the end of the day and they are not um, basically of the same class as Michigan. So let me just share my screen really quick. Um, okay, so here's the, the point where I wanna kind of call your attention to. Um, it, so let me, humor in this part, especially being the valet, you know, talking to Michigan and saying, you can't sit in this room and talk to me. You need to sit in the other room because that's the room that people are entered into from. You know, there's this kind of custom that the valet is trying to get Michigan to, um, to do what he wants them to do, but Michigan is like, ah, I, don't, I wanna be with you and talk to you. And then the valet is completely confused that, that Michigan doesn't have any understanding of how people normally act in this situation. So that's, I, I wanna quickly talk about this last part of the book because I wanna give you the hook into, into what's kinda coming next. Um, because there's a very important story about capital, what we call capital punishment. So people, um, people committing a crime and then receiving the death penalty. Um, it's a very kind of somber and sad subject that comes out at the end of this conversation with the valet. Um, but basically what happens is uh, Michigan talks about being in France and seeing a man who was executed. And Michigan says, you know, the, the valet I think mentions and says, you know, isn't it better to have it, the execution done with the guillotine, which is this big kind of um, system that they had in, in France where it's just this person places their head under a, a kind of system and then the, the knife drops and their, their head is cut off. It's a pretty uh, horrifying way to die. But the, the valet says, isn't it great that it's over so quickly so they feel no pain? Michigan says, uh, no, I don't think so because the, the fear that you have, the lack of hope that you have as you're waiting for your death, that's what makes it so horrible and so sad. Um, if you were to be, let's say, robbed and a, a, a thief came and stabbed you, you'd, you'd feel pain, but you'd still have hope that maybe, okay, maybe I can survive this. But there's no hope when you have the, the guillotine. It's, it's basically over for you. There's no pain. There's no moment where you have hope. And I think it's important to point this out this conversation continues later on about a different situation, uh, a situation when somebody was condemned to die, but ended up not getting uh, executed. Now, this is important to mention because Fyodor Dostoevsky in real life, this actually happened to him. Uh, what happened was he got in trouble because he was involved with this kind of group of people who were uh, in politics and they weren't really plotting to overthrow the government or anything, but they were talking about these radical ideas about, you know, maybe we should have no slaves or servants in society. They got in trouble. Uh, and the people in charge in, in Russia decided they're too dangerous politically. So they were sent to this place called Siberia. And he, basically Dostoevsky was condemned to die, um, but he ended up, uh, just as he was gonna be executed, they say, no, you're not actually going to die. Uh, and then Dostoevsky felt this feeling of being almost condemned to die and, and feeling as if he was already dead, having no hope, but then being given this gift of life. So I wanna end by saying that basically the book is in a way, this is representative because just as Mishkin had this illness and he felt like he was about to die, but he was given this new lease on life, that happened to Dostoevsky in real life too. So it's this idea of when you, when you know that death is, is a presence and something that you might be condemned to and you, maybe you don't have hope, but then the, this feeling of, I'm gonna make every moment count in life. I'm gonna you know, uh, embrace the gift of life. And that's something that Mishkin does throughout the book is he's, 
he believes in the, he loves life even though he has illness even though he deals with hardship he really uh enjoys every moment and we will learn in later parts of the book uh what happens to a guy who is so in love with life so innocent so honest with everybody he talks to um and what happens to that person does tragedy happen does he succeed in life uh, i will let you read and find out for yourself but i just wanted to leave off with that important point about um you know this embracing the magic of life which is in a way it's something that this book allowed me to connect with even if even as the book has dealt with very dark themes um, but ultimately i have felt this strong connection to the book the author and i hope you will too so thank you for sitting in on the lecture and um, I really, uh, if you need, if you want to continue reading the book and, and working on it, uh, you can reach out to one of our uh, wonderful supervisors at Mentu. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time. And yeah, I really hope you uh, want to continue reading the book.